First we saw a meltdown in Greece, and then bailouts for Ireland. Now, financial woes and indebtedness in Portugal, Spain, Italy. What is going on in Europe, and how might it affect your business? Hello, my name is Brenda Bailey Hughes, and our Cyber Focus guest today is going to help us break it all down and sort it all out. I'm pleased to introduce Travis Selmeyer, who is co-director of the Investment Management Academy at the Kelly School of Business, where he's also a visiting professor. Travis is a PhD candidate here at IU as well in political science, where he's focusing on the politics of international banking and investments. He spent 17 years working in international equities on and off Wall Street after receiving his MBA in finance from our very own Kelly School of Business. Welcome, Travis. So glad you're here. Thanks, Brenda. Nice Thanks to for meet you. The and time. Thank you. Thank you. I think we need to start with a vocab lesson. Sure. As I read some of the articles around the debt crisis in Europe, I read words like sovereign debt. I'm not even sure I exactly know what that is. Uh, periphery countries seem particularly interesting right now. Uh, uh -huh. Haircut, which seems to have a whole different context. I, I need one. So uh, okay, yes, so. <laughs> and maybe I do too, but, but I don't think that's what we're talking about. So define those terms and, uh, and any others that you think are relevant to this conversation. Sure. There's, you're right. There's a plethora of words in this industry, and it's very difficult sometimes to understand what specifically people are talking about. So to start with the last one first, since okay. obviously I need a haircut. <laughs> haircut is um, what happens when a bank or an investor or a financial institution owns uh, usually debt and has to write that debt down. Um, now, the context of haircut means that usually they negotiate a discount to the debt. So for instance, if they're holding it on their books at 100 uh, maybe the agreement is that it will be written down to 80 and perhaps whoever the agreement is with, they'll agree to take that, that debt off the bank's books. So uh, it's a way to restore health to the bank, in effect. Mm -hmm. um, periphery is a great word. It, it Literally, periphery just means obviously the edge of something. Mm -hmm. And um, we can look at periphery as, you know, in a sort of global sense, we could talk about, say, developing markets, mm -hmm. which play, developing economies play an interesting role in the European crisis, which we wouldn't think about, but, but they do. Uh, in the case of Europe, it means all the countries that are literally around the periphery of what we call core Europe or core European Union. Uh, so the core is sort of centered on Germany, especially, and France, and then um, then the uh, the lowland countries, the Netherlands, etc. So the periphery would be, uh, in this case, Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Ireland. So um, it's a geographical periphery. Yes, interestingly, it's geographical, and but it also means countries that may not have the sort of solid. Um, economic foundations that Germany has. Germany is the, the star, economic star to a large extent in Europe. So the, it also means periphery sort of distance from the star economy, the central mm. economy in Europe, which is Germany. And is it because they don't have that solid grounding that we're hearing so much about these particular countries in the news? Exactly, exactly, yes. Okay. Let's see the other Sovereign one. debt was another oh, one. Oh, sovereign debt. Yes, what an exciting word. So <laughs> debt, debt just means bonds. Okay. So we can have bonds from corporations. That's what we call private debt. Sovereign debt means government debt. So if, um, if the, um, say, the, 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 say Greece uh, issues a, a treasury bond, that's sovereign debt. A treasury bond from the United States, that's, that's actually sovereign debt as well. Okay. And why is that word so important these days? That word's important because to, to explain that, we sort of have to explain how the EU got started and why, okay. why we're all so concerned about the future of the EU. So um, the reason sovereign debt's important is many of these periphery countries have high debt. They have higher debt than they might have had had they not joined the EU. Is having high debt in and of itself a good or a bad thing, or it just is? Well, it's generally, you know, we're Hoosiers here, so we're, we're uh, I mean, I'm from Indiana, so we're generally pragmatic people. Right. And, 
And uh, so generally, we always think debt is a bad right, thing. Right, I do, I do. Some debt's okay, um, but it has to, we have to be able to pay it off. Okay. And the question that's come up for a lot of these periphery countries is, can they pay off the debt? In some cases, in the case of Ireland, for instance, Ireland entered this crisis with very low sovereign debt, around 30, 35 um, percent. When the U.S. entered the, uh, the crisis, as an example, when the U.S. entered the crisis in uh, 2007, we were around 65 percent sovereign debt. So Ireland looked really good. Anything yeah. around 60 percent is good. Really? Ireland looked great. Okay. Ireland, though, has to bail out its banks. So a lot of the concerns right now with sovereign debt are that countries are going to have to issue significant amounts of debt. The governments are going to have to issue a lot of debt to bail out the banks. Okay. And that's a problem. So the, the odd thing is the periphery countries, as you said, well, it's geographic. And it is to a large extent. Ireland was very different from, for instance, Greece which had high debt going into the... Even higher than a comparable U.S. at 65? It was uh, at that or above that when it entered the EU okay. in the 1990s. Okay. I was a portfolio manager then, and so we were watching Greece, and we invested in Greece before it entered the EU because we knew what the European Union is the EU. Once it entered the EU, um, it had a lot of strong, healthy brothers, to put it in a sort of mm -hmm. uh, Indiana farming <laughs> perspective. So Greece was, I don't want to call it the runt, but Greece was a small, uh, somewhat indebted, less developed country in a European sense. When it entered the European Union, it meant that the European Union had funds that it would help to uh, spend to develop Greece more. So it invested in Greece. Greece was able to get these funds. Greece was able to issue more debt to invest in the infrastructure, et cetera. The um, problem is that the, the, the problem is that Greece never reformed some of its markets, like its labor market. People can retire at, in some cases, in their early 50s on a very large pension uh, and Greeks have a great diet, they tend to live as long as we do, so you're talking about, you know, supporting somebody for 30 years on a 30 or 35 years on a pension. Hmm. Um, so this was unsustainable, and it, it's, the labor markets are very tight in, in a lot of Europe, and Greece is a good example. It's difficult to lay people off, not, not that we want to encourage that, right. but, but sometimes when bad economic times come, um, companies or the government has to shed people, has to lay people off, and Greece didn't do it. So Greece was able to issue all this debt, um, but retain a lot of the great reasons why why it's great to be a Greek. I mean, right. I can retire at 53, and, you know, I can go out to life. live long. I can go out to the islands, and I don't have to work so hard. And um, so it sounds like the best of all possible worlds, and it was too good to be true. I hear the uh, acronym PIGS, which is so mean, and, and, and you, you know, you frequently hear people even kind of slap it and say, you know, say it, the, the Portugal, what is Ireland, Italy, what am I missing, G would be? Uh, Greece. Greece and Spain. Spain. Okay, so there they are, and that, that and sometimes, PIGS is an appropriate acronym, but is that true? Yeah, I mean, sometimes Ireland they say is, PIGS because oh. it includes, it could be Ireland and Iceland, or Ireland oh. and Italy, so it depends on how you... But it sounds as though that the reason that they're all in a crisis is very, it's very different for each place. Ireland, it's a banking yes. reason. Greece, it's lifestyle and length of life and pension orientation. Yes. Okay. Very so, true. So very different reasons. Uh, and yet everybody's different. a mess. Everybody's a mess in part because of, so that sort of brings us to this idea of the EU. By joining the EU... The governments, each government's debt was considered triple uh, A rated, which means the top rating. Okay. So banks could hold the debt of any country uh, on their books um, and say that this is very high quality debt. They don't have to hold a lot of additional capital to hold this debt because it was considered extremely low risk. Mm -hmm. and, and banks are required to hold different amounts of 
capital depending on the risk of the asset they have. Okay. So extremely low risk debt. German debt was treated like Greek debt on a bank's books. But Greece had to pay a higher interest rate. So guess what banks bought? They bought higher interest issue, higher interest paying debt. You know, mm -hmm. Greek debt, German debt. Hey, if the Greek debt's paying, you know, two percent more and sure. it's treated the same, why it's don't still I buy AAA Greek debt? Rating? Why not? Exactly. So the European banks are stuffed with debt from the sovereign debt from the periphery countries greek portugal uh, italy spain okay spain and italy are enormous so our real worries are developing because the concern is that what's happened in smaller periphery countries like greece uh, ireland and possibly uh, possibly portugal may happen in much bigger countries like Italy and Spain. Among the sixth or seventh largest economies in the world, that would be a disaster um, and very difficult for the European Union's uh, stabilization funds, various stabilization mm -hmm. funds, in conjunction with the IMF, it would be very difficult for this group to to sustain them. We, 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 we've calculated that they can bail them out. Okay. But the concern is that we may not be able to sustain them if there's a what we call a buying strike. Investors say, hey, I'm not going to touch Spanish debt for three years. Mm -hmm. Then we're fairly convinced that, that there's not enough money in all these stabilization funds and the IMF and the European Central Bank to sustain, say, a Spain as well as the other countries for three years if, if, if there was a buying strike. What would that look like if... Well, I mean, you say it's a disaster, but what do, what does it look like? Um, well, we don't know, but I, okay. I, I think we, we can guess. And this is how, remember you, we ask, you ask about periphery countries, right. and I said, well, in some ways we, we, we used to talk about periphery countries as developing economies. We can look at what happened in developing economies to see um, what might happen in Europe. So in developing countries, we've seen these buyer strikes happen before. Okay. Argentina, Argentina is kind of a serial defaulter. Yeah. They, they've been through three defaults in the last 30-odd uh, years. All right. So typically, it's difficult for Argentina to get off a of bond issuance uh, within three or four years of a default. And then they tiptoe back into the market. They've tiptoed back into the market before and been able to get a bond issuance out. So this three-year argument is sort of a, a very much a worst-case scenario. Mm -hmm. um, Greece, Greece has been a little profligate in its spending and it has labor issues, but uh, Spain and Ireland are, you know, there are some structural issues, but these are pretty well-managed economies. So for they're not serial defaulters. In fact, Ireland has a, has a, has a great mm -hmm. uh, potential growth path, has had for 20 years. We expect it to continue. So it's unlikely we'd see a three-year buyer strike. But if we did, so that's a very much a worst-case scenario, a very small percentage. Mm -hmm. If we did, the European banks would be forced to take significant haircuts on all this mm -hmm. debt. Some of them would be uh, technically bankrupt. Um, some of them may simply go bankrupt. It's unclear. There's a, you've heard the phrase too big to fail. Right. We use that a lot in the United States. So the idea in a too big to fail bank is that the bank is so important to the national economy that the national Authorities can't let it go bankrupt. Hence our own bailouts. That Hence our own here. bailouts. And, and, mm -hmm. and the United States was able to fund those. Um, the story in Ireland is that the, uh, the, the certainly the largest Irish bank, the um, Anglo-Irish bank, is for Ireland itself too big to save. Oh my goodness. The debts were so large that Ireland could not fund could not fund the recapitalization. They had to go outside. So the concern is that, and again, this is a worst case scenario, right. but the concern is that 
a larger bank. Uh, Anglo-Irish requires, it's up to date, about 32 billion uh, euros to refund. That's a lot of money. That's, that's close to, let's see, present. That's around, let's say that's around 30 billion dollars. Um, 30 some billion, 35 billion dollars. Um, larger banks would require obviously larger packages, so the concern is that the authorities simply couldn't recapitalize all the banks. Hmm. I think I have a much better understanding of what has led us to the crisis and what this might evolve into, worst case scenario. Um, let, let's wrap today by, by me asking you, is there going to be a, any kind of rippling effect? Will, will, it, will it, a business in Indiana know that this is happening in Ireland or Spain or Portugal? Yeah, absolutely. So? We are so, now we're so tied into a global economy. And Indiana, um, present governor uh, Mitch Daniels and past governors have done a great job of tying us more closely into global economy. I mean, Indiana is full of, I grew up on a farm part of my life in Indiana. Mm -hmm. I trained as a carpenter when I was 12, I'm 55. We have a long history of very skilled labor, yeah. um, very skilled production, um, global, globally qualified production in many industries. So we're affected by uh, at least in, in at least three ways we could be affected here. The first is if um, if there were a, a, a continuing crisis or a worse crisis in Europe it's going to dampen demand for our products. Mm. That means everything from pharmaceuticals to, I mean, we're, we are a global leader in, for instance, artificial limbs and all kinds of joint replacement. They're, they're, so even though these are... These don't seem like um, products that you just skip buying. Well, people can put... There, there is a, um, an interesting... Um, Phenomena that people will put off, say, a joint replacement if they can't okay. afford it. Okay, all right. So there is usually a delay. So regardless of our product, exports stand to be... Yes, and those are the products that, you know, you'd think, okay, I'm not going to stop immune. taking my, my, right. my drug, right? right. I, I, need it. I, you know, I need it for my heart. But um, other products, like we're, we're a global leader, in Indiana's a global leader in, for instance, all kinds of wood products. We're, we'll so definitely see a hit. Cabinets, yeah. et cetera. So that's the first thing. Okay. Demand from Europe could fall. Okay. The euros declined against the dollar on a trade-weighted, what we call a trade-weighted basis, by about 8% in 2010, okay. which meant U.S. products became um, less competitive vis-a-vis -vis mm. the same products that would be produced in Europe. So we may be affected by that. So there's the currency aspect. There's so I'm still building the same wooden cabinet, but it, it used to be competitive, but because of the currency issue, it, it no longer is. Yeah, it may so not I, be as competitive. As competitive. Yes. So I suddenly start losing customers to competitors because of currency. Yes. And I may just lose customers because they're not buying. Exactly. Okay. And the now, third? And the third is that uh, it's just the economic shock that might happen. So we saw what happened with the mortgage-backed crisis here in the United States that rippled around the world. Um, the, some of the most affected banks were not in the United States, they were in Europe. They were holding massive amounts of mortgage-backed securities and, and securities that are related to mortgages. If Europe had a major economic problem, that's going to ripple around the rest of the world because our banks are interlinked to some mm -hmm. extent because um, investment may tighten up. Now, in some interesting ways, Indiana may benefit. Hmm. Indiana may benefit because we are actually fairly stable. Um, we, Indiana is, uh, some of our, our, our economists here at IU and Purdue and Ball State have analyzed that Indiana is coming out of this recession in the United States a little faster than average. So we're stable, we're pulling in um, some great uh, investments, which could continue, and so problems in Europe may actually make us more attractive to 
Chinese manufacturers mm. to uh, Chinese Chinese telecom manufacturers, say, or, or Japanese car manufacturers or Brazilian uh, beer companies. or So in, in an interesting way, Indiana may benefit as well to turmoil in Europe, and I think we are. I'm just worried that the costs may outweigh the benefits. Oh, the, the, the larger issues of the rippling and the export problems in the currency exchange just outweigh what little benefit there might be. But if nonetheless, it blows up. But nonetheless, I'm hanging on to the fact that there might be a shred of good news even as we talk about the European crisis. And, and that's, that's wonderful news. We're glad to, to bring that to the table once in a while. Thank you so much for being here today, You're Travis. Welcome. It's good to see you. Time. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.